crime scene photos, a list of every single person that set foot on that crime scene, their contact information, when they came and when they left. Photos of the victims, photos of things that haven't been taken, a map or a layout of the land, cell phone histories, medical histories, autopsy files, fire investigator files, a list of witnesses and all the follow-ups you've done, any type of financial documentation. All of these things are things that a detective would have in the case file on homicide if they were thoroughly investigating the case. It was said Hutzler murder case file was handed from Detective Brand, our first investigator, to Detective Maynard, that there were only four pages in that file. Four. The ball has been dropped and we have to find out what's going on here. Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ray. Today we're going to be diving into part two of a series on the David and Mackie murder files. If you have not watched the first video, you need to go back and do that. I'm going to list that directly down below. Should be the first link. So go back there, watch that video, and then come back. We've seen people who've signed the petition. The GoFundMe, we still need to work on that, but we'll get there. And in fact, if anybody can think of any ways that we can raise money for this, uh, please comment below. I'm not really good at this stuff. So if you have any creative ideas on how to do that, I'd love to hear about them. So I want to thank the people who have reached out. It takes courage to do so. And I want to thank you all for getting involved. So just like the other video, I have to put a trigger warning in here. There's some disturbing topics that we're going to talk about. Also, I have to make it a point to tell you that this video is for educational purposes. Everything is alleged unless I say otherwise. And unfortunately, this very annoying thing is going to pop up every now and then throughout the video to remind everyone that these are alleged things that are being said unless otherwise stated. There just happens to be someone that we're going to talk about today that probably has his lawyer on his Christmas list and, and sends him birthday presents. So it has to be said and has to be said loud and clear. So as usual, the contact information will be listed down below. If your gut is telling you something, reach out to us, listen to it. And again, the purpose of me diving into this and putting these videos out there is to get all the eyes on it that we can. So please like, please share, comment if you'd like to, to help get this message out there. It's been 11 years, let's help this family. So guys, let's get close into it, unravel the case and see what we can pull out. This is the David and Mackie Hutzler murder files, part two. So let's take a step back and recap what happened in the last video. January 6, 2012, 56-year-old David Hutzler and 9-year-old Mackie, his son, were shot execution style in their trailer and they were set on fire. So this murder occurred between 8.15 in the morning and 8.26. We know that because there was a bus that sits at their residence from eight o'clock until 8.15, and then it will turn back around. So we know that when the bus left, um, that's when the crime happened because when he turns back around and comes through, the fire has started. That's all the time that it took in order for someone to pull off this crime. Mackie had a glancing wound on his chin as if he was fighting someone, and then David has been shot in the head. Now he's been shot on the right side in the back. However, he is left-handed. David had no accelerants in his lungs. Mackie had 17% accelerants in his lungs. David was drug and alcohol free according to that autopsy and there was no gun found. Four places where the accelerants were used, most likely two of those places were on their bodies 
because they were charred enough to where it, they were unrecognizable. Now, in addition to this, we know that the Christmas tree was knocked down in their home. We know that the cords were cut in his home. He had a video system, so whoever did this knew to cut those cords so that they wouldn't be videotaped. Now, there was dispute about this. Uh, at one point, they told Kelly, the daughter, and the sister that the cords had been cut, and then they kind of came back and said, no, they weren't. So one of two things, they were cut and you're lying now, or they weren't cut and you have a video. We do not know if ballistics were done to compare the bullet that was found in Mackie to the bullet that was found in David. So we have no idea if there's a possibility that there are two murderers. We have $8,000 that sat in his pocket, gold that was still in the trailer. We have 58 firearms and his store that was right next to the trailer. It was not broken into. So obviously this is not a robbery of any sort. The theory that Detective Brand stuck to was that this was a murder-suicide. Allegedly, he did this before the coroner's report was even finished. In all of this, everyone who was close to David absolutely said there was no way at all that he would kill his son. No way at all he would do this murder-suicide. Just was not in his nature. I mean, the guy didn't even like to go hunting because he didn't like to kill animals. And there was just no way that that is how this happened. And the investigators got it all wrong. You know, my initial first phone calls with Kelly, there's something that she repeated to me several times. And that is the fact that we have to go all the way back to the beginning to understand the timeline of how this happened and the things that went wrong. And after talking with her and after looking into this, she really has a good point. So I just briefly want to say here that I am not anti-police or anti-government or anything like that. You know, I understand that there are both good police out there and bad police. And I just wanted to state that because there's going to be a lot of negative things that are going to come up in this situation. So let me just back up to October 2022 when I sent in Freedom of Information Acts to the West Virginia State Police and the Ber Berkeley County Police. I received a response from both within the first week and there's confusion here. Detective Nahn, the current detective on the case, he writes me back to say that he can't share any information but that he considers the case closed or slash solved on his end. Now, in order for a case to be considered closed, there's typically an arrest. The West Virginia State Police write back stating that the case is still open and therefore they will not be giving me any information either. So I just thought this was interesting because this just shows you that there's no communication there. Since we're talking about the detectives, you know, we've had four detectives in the past 11 years, five if you include Bur Burkhart. In 11 years, I can tell you that all the friends and family that I've spoken to have said they have never been interviewed twice. Some of them haven't even been interviewed once for this. But four detectives, and they've only been interviewed once, if at all, to me, you're letting that case go cold. It's not going cold on its own. You're letting it go cold because there are things you can do. There are opportunities that you're not taking to help this family get justice. So the detectives. In line, it would be Detective Brandt. He was only on there for three or four months. Included with that, we have Detective Burkhart. He just seems to be maybe like a second investigator go-to. Um, he's also involved in it, but it's not actually his case. So Detective Brandt, Detective Burkhart, then Maynard jumps aboard, and Detective Burkhart's still in the background. Um, Maynard does a lot of really good work when I go into that. Maynard gets moved, and then Detective Walker comes on board. 
Detective Walker. The only thing that we can see that he did is possibly took polygraphs. However, we have no actual polygraph reports. Um, so did he really? We don't know. Detective Walker gets put off the case and then Detective Nine, he is the current detective on the case and Detective Burkhart still lingering in the background. So Detective Nine has been on the case for about a year and a half, two years now. Through the time that Nine has been on the case, he and Kelly have had a couple conversations, but he says that his leads have dried up. So at the time of this crime, Detective Brand was around 26, 27, something like that. And only two months after this crime happened, Detective Brand would be put on leave. He would later plead guilty to fraud. He was double dipping, claiming money from both the National Guard and from his police work. The courts would order him to pay almost $4,500 in restitution, and he was relieved from his duties. His retirement and pension has been held by the state. So this is the type of crime that's thought out. It's planned. And if you can do something like that as an officer, what else are you capable of? Automatically, you're telling us your morals aren't there. This is a clear indication that you have no problem taking advantage of your position. So what else are you capable of? I think these are all very fair questions. Now, the excuse that's been given over and over again as to Brand's missteps, everybody just keeps saying he was young. He was a young detective. There are things that are just common sense that you don't have to be a detective for. Remember, no soot could be found in David's lungs. And on top of that, the murder weapon was not at the scene when he ruled this a murder-suicide. So that right there is major common sense. And there was an idea thrown around, I believe, by Detective Burkhart that they thought maybe the gun just incinerated. However, the only part of that trailer that was burnt was the bedroom. And it could not have been on fire that much longer from when that 911 call came in to when the fire officials got there because the rest of the trailer was salvageable. Kelly said there was dust, but nothing else. Now, if you're going to incinerate a gun, I think you're going to take out a hell of a lot more than just a bedroom. Just an opinion. I'm not a fire investigator, but it sounds like bullshit to me. So because Detective Brand is young, we want to sweep that under the rug. The fact that he got the ruling completely ass backwards. Okay. If there was such a concern that he was young, then why didn't he have someone standing directly over top of him, making sure this got solved the way it should have been? Remember, in Berkeley County, there were only four homicides in 2012. You have to give that homicide to the brand new detective or the young detective? Are you serious? What kind of, what kind of, what kind of call is that? Why isn't someone meticulously checking his work? When you have a fire chief and another investigator telling you that this is a homicide and you still rule over them because you can. None of this is acceptable. And the answer of he was young is not acceptable. So tell me why I can find these FBI files right here that show the exact procedure of a crime scene. Tell me why I can find these with just a click of a mouse on a computer. And your detective isn't properly trained on this? How does that happen? Does this happen with all your detectives or did this one just fall through the cracks? So we talked about in video one how David was making preparations to move. Uh, it seemed like he wanted to move pretty quickly. Again, he's got a family member over here that is threatening him. And then he's got the Russo group over here that is making threats towards him. And 
Do you, I mean, do you have any doubt that he wouldn't want to get the hell away? So Detective Brian hears from a couple people that he says he wants to get away, he wants to go on vacation. And I think it's convenient that he used those to fit that into a murder-suicide story. However, David's friend, Annie, explains that she called and spoke to a detective early on in this case. Let's say it would probably be Detective Brand or Detective Burkhart. And she actually contacted them. Here she tells us very clearly that she made it clear that David was planning to move. It took a little bit, but I did some, you know, I waited for the news articles to come out where I got names of law enforcement. And then I contacted law enforcement. I do not remember who I talked to specifically because uh, I left a message at first. But then when they called back, they asked me um, how long I knew him, when I had had contact, what did I know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I told them what I did know. Um, they asked me if I knew how many guns he had, if I knew uh, anything about his finances. Um, and at that time, I did know what his finances were. I knew what kind of currencies he had. I knew what kind of silver and gold he had. And yeah, I knew about the weapons. And I asked them, did you recover that stuff? And they said, yeah, it's all here. I'm straightforward. I don't believe this was a murder-suicide. I really, really don't. Because he's planning on coming and living on my property. You told them that? I did. And I told them, you know, we had just, I was the last one to speak to him. And everything was great that night. Detective Brand also went to this little corner store where David would go and chat with people. And the lady that was there is unfortunately no longer with us, but she had been one to report that David said he needed a vacation and he needed to get away. I can't think of her name right off hand, but this is the young lady. She was older. She knew my dad his entire life. She's the one who told the state police that uh, Daddy said that her and him and Baby Mackie was going to take a vacation and never come back, which was four years prior to January 6th. Now, what I've heard from other people is that David kind of jumped on a couple conspiracy theory wagons. And because of that, he could have came across a little odd to some people. And I even sat down with one of his friends who he himself admitted he was a tinfoil hat person. And that's why he and David got along so well. So in the statement to the press, Trooper Brand claims that David was acting unstable and questionable. He says he received several accounts of the victim, David, making suicidal comments. And that over the years, he has basically become mentally unstable. Who stated that? Did, did you ask his close friends? Or were you just asking random people that went into his store and chatted with them? Because that's going to give you two different results. And the idea that he was paranoid, of course he's paranoid. He's got a family member threatening his life. And he's got a Rusa group that has been threatening him. Of course he's paranoid. But he's trying to move. He's trying to get away from it. And it just seems so clear that that was his plan of action, that he was going to move to Mississippi. He wanted to get away. He was just too late. So remember, when all this is happening, Detective Burkhart's in the background, uh, but obviously not being any type of mentor at all to him um or if he is then i'm even a little bit more concerned but detective burkhart's just kind of lingering in the background but he's supporting this right here is an entry that of a quote of him saying that he's backing brand up they have no reason to believe this was a double homicide kelly said that about six years after these murders there were producers from tnt she says that Burkhart refused them access to anything that they would need, 
refused to cooperate with them and stated something to the effect of they don't do that sort of thing there. Kelly said that she and Burkhart basically had a really hot and cold type of relationship. You know, he he backed up Trooper Brand with that ruling. So, of course, you know, they're not on the best terms. But then later, she states that Burkhart actually tried to help her and encourage her to handle things a certain way. And he was actually being positive. However, when Burkhart moved from Berkeley County to Jefferson County, he almost seemed to be relieved in not having to deal with her in the case anymore. Now, Detective Maynard is our second investigator on the case, and he stayed on that case for two and a half years and did a lot of work. Detective Maynard did that case so much justice. When he looked into it, and as he talked to Kelly more, he was able to get the ruling changed to double homicide. And he took off with it. It was great. He answered Kelly's calls. He called her. You know, this whole time, Kelly is talking to people and seeing what she can find out. And Detective Maynard's willing to listen to all of it. He put it in the newspaper that the ruling had been changed. Linesburg Journal. We couldn't get the front page of the Martinsburg Journal. We got a little space in the back where they recanted it as a double murder. We couldn't get the front page of the journal because at that time, um, a trooper, a cop, had shot his wife. But you put it on the front page when you said my daddy did it. Trooper Maynard and I, we worked very close together. I'm talking about height. Trooper Maynard had him as Daddy and Baby Mackie as the screensaver on his laptop. He put it on the internet and in the newspaper that he needed help. He wanted to talk to anyone who could be involved. He investigated several people. And without a doubt, I think that Detective Maynard had his heart in it. And he really wanted to help the family. Detective Maynard, according to Kelly, points out that family member, Chapter 8, as a suspect. He had her wear a wire when meeting with Chapter 8, and there's a witness to this. And it seemed just like when he was really making headway, he calls Kelly one day and says, can you meet me in the office late tonight? She's probably thinking and even hoping that there's a major break in the case, or maybe even an arrest is coming. But that most certainly was not the case. He goes into the office. There's barely anybody there. It's late at night. She says that Detective Maynard tells her, there's a higher power here and they're moving me. So Detective Walker is on the case the longest time out of anybody. But Kelly said that there were never any updates from him. Even when she called, there wasn't an update for him to give. And she really feels like he just didn't give a shit. But that's her opinion. Of course, we don't know if anything was happening in the department. If there was any investigation being done still. But that was her feeling on how he handled it. So Detective Nine definitely deserves a spot in this video, but we're going to wait until the end to discuss his actions and how he is handling the case. You know, when you have authorities to take an oath, you are to honor that. You are to honor your badge. The system is corrupted. This system has destroyed me mentally. So again, I'm not anti-police, but you start searching for West Virginia police and the information is out there. There are so many people with so many stories about how they've been mistreated by police in West Virginia. And again, I know that's not every policeman. I get that. But when people say things like this over and over and over, really makes you wonder. This needs to be brought up because this is a pattern, apparently. 
of doing questionable things. This long ass letter went to the governor as well as senators. This letter involves police officers who are named in actions of misconduct. And this includes sexual assault. This includes cameras in the women's locker room, which they have made an announcement and apologized for. So I would say if they apologized for it, they were able to prove that that's what happened. Over aggressive tactics that led to a death of a man on I-81. Now I want to praise this whistleblower because I know it takes an incredible amount of courage to go up against so many people, especially when you have so many high ranking people, because it's logical to think that you're going to have retaliation against you. And sadly, it looks like the West Virginia police did just that. They retaliated. So there has been a huge scandal brewing at the West Virginia State Police. I mean, we have affairs with, with the top individuals, the top senior staff. We have lying. We have falsification of records, falsification of reports, stealing taxpayer money. We have, I mean, recording the girls' locker room, uh, fights. I and mean, the level of specificity, I mean, you know that that guy knows. Then the state trooper, suspected of being the whistleblower who wrote the letter, gets arrested the day before he's scheduled to testify at a grievance hearing where top brass from the state police was apparently subpoenaed to be questioned under oath by the whistleblower's attorney about allegations of corruption and misconduct. State police had arrested one of their own. News Channel 3's Curtis Johnson sat down with the arrested trooper's attorney who says his client is innocent and the charges are pure retaliation from the agency. David Moy represents Joseph Comer, a corporal with the West Virginia State Police. He was arrested last Friday on charges of felony strangulation and misdemeanor domestic battery. Comer's arrest comes about one week after an anonymous letter detailing serious allegations of wrongdoing by West Virginia State Police was sent to lawmakers and government officials. Comer's attorney says he believes the agency thinks Comer is the author of the anonymous letter, and that's the reason for his arrest. So you believe that these charges were in direct retaliation for the believed role they thought he had in the letter? Absolutely, I believe that. I think it's very evident that that's what happened. Moy would neither confirm nor deny if his client wrote the anonymous letter. Yet he says some of its allegations are consistent with concerns Comer had reported to state police management. But the attorney says nothing was done about the issues. Instead, it backfired. He says, shortly after, Comer was suspended without pay and demoted in rank. What was the reason for the demotion? Uh, what I consider a kind of a trumped up, uh, out of hand complaint that they didn't even list who the complainant was. They said it was internal. That's when Comer contacted Moy about a year ago for help filing a grievance. Testimony in a hearing related to that grievance was set for last Friday morning, just hours after state police obtained warrants for Comer's arrest. Thursday night. Felony strangulation, misdemeanor, domestic battery. Why did those charges come about? I believe that they came as a, a smokescreen trying to prohibit him from testifying when we had our hearing on Friday morning. Crimes Comer is accused of committing both happened two months earlier. WSAZ has confirmed the woman referenced in the documents is also a member of the West Virginia State Police. Is also a member of the West Virginia State Police. The whole thing is compromised when when you have months that go by and and you say, well, you know, she didn't report it and there's no evidence other than what she says. I've already gotten word that the people who worked around her never saw any type of bruising, never heard her say that he did anything. So if these allegations are true, then there's a huge systemic problem within the West Virginia State Police. And I'm going to tell you now, if it's true, there's absolutely no way that this was not happening back in 2012 when these murders happened. It was happening way before then. We need police, but we need honest, hardworking police. Police that actually stand for people. It questions the morals of these officers, the motives of these officers. It's relevant, and we just can't get around that.
I want to talk just briefly about the PI that Kelly hired. And this gentleman, she retained him for a dollar because he was so invested in finding justice and just found this crime absolutely terrible, like all of us do. So he he basically volunteers, but there's that dollar retainer and he takes the Hutzler case and he works on it for years. So the PI goes to Kelly and says with as much work as he's done on the case, he flat out told her that he couldn't get any further in the case because he was being blocked by the, the superintendent. We're not sure which superintendent he claimed to have been the obstacle in this matter, but it was enough for him to say that he wasn't going to be able to go any further. Because he was digging so hard, he actually fractured some relationships, but he just wanted to get to the bottom of it. Those people were in the way. They weren't going to help them. His best advice to Kelly was to get a good attorney. Later, when Kelly talked to a detective, and I'm not going to name him, she was told that that PI was definitely not a friend of the office. Was it his personality or was it the fact that he wasn't going to stop? He has since retired. However, he still follows this case. He's not actively working on it, but he knows where certain people are right now. And he's still involved, even though he isn't. So when these murders took place, Kelly was living in New Jersey. And unfortunately, her relationship with her dad was strained. But there were some comments made that they were going to try to work things out. David actually put an ad in the paper seeking information on finding Kelly when he was unable to find her and get a hold of her. So it's obvious that he definitely wanted some kind of contact again. Now there's something that I wanna explain and explain very clearly because I'm sure people have question. I know there's a theory out there that is just completely wrong and I wanna address it. When these murders happened, Kelly was living in New Jersey and she and her dad weren't on the best of terms at that time. But when this happened, She came back to West Virginia and was asking those questions and talking to those detectives. And throughout the whole time that she's living in New Jersey, she continues this. She continues calling and she continues to sit outside in the parking lot waiting for the detective on her case. I fought for a year straight to get it from murder-suicide. I called, I showed up. I traveled Greyhounds. I traveled buses, more buses, the the cheap China bus. I traveled the the Amtrak back and forth from the state of New Jersey to West Virginia until I moved here. They made me move here. She has since moved back to West Virginia, and she's still on this case. There was a post on Facebook that there was a rumor that Kelly was somehow involved, that Kelly wanted the money, Kelly wanted the property. There's still this idea, this crazy idea that Kelly had hired someone or a couple people to take her dad out for the land. When it comes to the property, she didn't even claim her dad's property for a year or so. She got a real estate agent when she realized that she was able to take a hold of that property. She didn't know that that property should have went to her. Another family had her taken over. And I've seen documentation where she actually has rights to some other state, four or five. But she hasn't even worried with that because she's so invested in just getting justice. But I think because of this, this statement was made. The possibility that Kelly hired someone to do this. So there was rumors that there were two black men with dreadlocks acting suspicious around the area at the time this murder happened. I tried to find out where the source of this information came from, but I couldn't. So I'm going to guess it's just a rumor that started in the area, a terrible rumor. I cannot stress enough that Kelly is not involved. Okay, I just, there's no way in hell. She has been the main one 
at times the only one fighting for this case to be solved. When Detective Brand made the call that this was a murder-suicide, Kelly received a phone call five minutes before it happened, but five minutes before the press release. Why would you do that to someone? What if she wants to be there? Do you not want her there because she's going to ask the right questions? After this was officially named a murder-suicide, Kelly wrote the governor. And there was someone in that office, we'll call her Leah, that consistently spoke with Kelly. Every time Kelly called in, Leah already knew her case. Kelly called in with the updates, more questions, and then Leah moved to a different position. Kelly doesn't know this. She calls after that happens and finds that Leah's no longer there. And neither is her case file. They typed in Kelly Hutzler's name and the page was empty. So Kelly has to relive this all over again. Every detail, what she was told, the updates that she had, all over. What do you think happened to that file? It disappeared. So after the third time, she emails the governor, and that's basically where she's at right now with that. Now, after Detective Maynard was moved, Kelly ends up getting sued. And the reason why is because she has been open about the fact that she has been told, allegedly, that chapter eight, that that family member, that nephew, was a suspect. And because she's doing her own research and she's trying to find out what's going on with that, it gets back to him and he ends up suing her. $100,000 for a defamation lawsuit. When she goes to court, that wiretap didn't exist anymore. It was gone. And Detective Maynard said that he never labeled Chapter 8 as a suspect. She is ordered to pay $100,000 to the person that she considers a suspect in the murders. Even though Maynard was not on the case anymore, because Kelly had such a good working relationship with him in the beginning, before that lawsuit came across, she wanted to talk to him more about the case and see if he would give her more information. She's called several times and emailed, and there's just no response. I'm wondering if that higher power threatened him. So Kelly was so excited to have a new detective on her case. Detective Nine started not that long ago, about two years, and she was very, very hopeful that he was going to be the one that was going to solve this. Somehow from the beginning to where we are right now, that relationship has soured. And what it sounds like, it soured for no reason, no real reason. Something that I haven't mentioned is the fact that Kelly did not even know that there wasn't a gun present until Detective Nine came aboard. No other detective before that told her that information. So this to her is still new. She calls Detective Nine's office, he answers, and they speak a little bit on the case. And he alleges us to Kelly, give me eight months and I'll have the gun. Of course, this is perplexing and Kelly has no idea why he's saying this. In the next phone call, Kelly catches up with him. There's no real update. It's been over nine months now. It's been, been about a year since he's made that statement. And there's no gun. Nothing's been found. He hasn't called her. No update. So she calls into the office and again speaks with him just for him to tell her that there's no update. She asks him to pick a time, pick any time, and she will come in and speak with him about information that he has received from other people. She has information that she believes is important to the case. He refuses. He refuses. This is the kicker. He tells Kelly, why am I obligated to contact you? Why do I need to contact you? Why do I need to speak with you? 
He said that to a family member who had two of her other family members murdered. She's a victim in this case too. And that was said to her. His attitude still hasn't changed for me. But when I did call him and then I had to call him again and I had to call him again. And when he got on the phone with me, he was very, very rude. And he explained to me, why am I obligated to speak to you? Why would you say something like that to me? And all I'm doing is checking up on my loved ones. That's why you are obligated to speak to me, sir. And you explained to me over a year ago that you would have the murder weapon in nine months, Mr. Nine. And I asked you then, how, how are you predicting the weapon? And then when I'm explaining to him, he says, well, I don't have any other leads. This is what happened. No, what I'm explaining to you is just sit down and talk to me. Now that statement right there, that is not something that allegedly happened. I was there when that call took place. I was there when he said that. It was on speakerphone and I was right next beside Kelly. And I was right next to Kelly. That conversation, those comments were made. Egos. Egos have ruined more cold cases than failed evidence. That's a fact. I just want to share the information about closing a case. And this is factors within the police control that lead to closure. And there are four main things listed that detectives should do to give this case the best chance of being solved. Three or four detectives should be assigned. The detective should describe the crime scene, including the measurements and their reports. Detectives follow up on all witnesses and their information. Detectives attend the post-mortem examination. So these are the actions that give the detectives the best chance of closing a case. And three out of four of these were not met. It is so frustrating that so many things went wrong from the start and just continued to go wrong. The original ruling with no gun, the fact that when the ruling does get changed, Barely anybody knows it because it gets a tiny article in the back of the newspaper and nothing else. The lead detective that started that case ends up getting fired for fraud. Missing evidence, missing wiretap, missing polygraph test results if they were taken. Kelly's files at the governor's office keep disappearing. You have a reward money that someone has offered to bump up from one grand to five grand. And the detective tells him there's no need. You have TNT coming to you. Can we do a true crime story on what happened here? Can we help you? And they deny that. You have the fact that PI comes to you and says, I can't move any further because the superintendent of the state police will not get a hold of me, will not return my calls, and I'm blocked from doing anything further. He said in his 35 plus years that he has done PI detective work, that has never happened to him. A current detective that is refusing to sit down with Kelly. So many things that happened that beg the question of why. Why was Detective Brand so hell-bent on calling this a murder-suicide? Why was Detective Maynard moved? Did that higher power not approve of the way he was investigating that case and what he was stirring up? Can we get answers to these questions? So I know many of you have probably wondered where Mackie's mom has been in this situation. And I can tell you, I've tried to reach out to her two different ways. However, I don't know if I have the correct contact information. I have not been contacted back. So if you're listening, feel free to contact me. Just reach out. I'm not going to put anything on YouTube that you don't want on YouTube. It can just be a conversation. And if you don't want to reach out to me, that's absolutely fine. We have no idea what you went through then and what you're going through now. So I respect either decision. 
I just wanted to open that door. To everyone else, I'll just make it clear right here that she had nothing to do with this, okay? The police investigated her, I'm sure. Never once did she come on the police or Kelly's radar. So you remember I said in the beginning that some people have been reaching out after that first video. Well, luckily I was able to contact the bus driver, the bus driver that sat in the Hutzler's driveway throughout the day. And I was able to ask him some really important questions and he corrected me as well. It turns out he was not the first one on scene and he was not the first one to make the phone call to emergency services. So what I've been told, it seems like it's incorrect then. I was told that on that morning you were sitting there from 8 o'clock to 8.15. And then when you turned back around, that's when you saw the fire and called the police. Yeah. No, I didn't call the police. Okay. Gotcha. They, they got a hold of me because they saw me turn around uh, and go by in the afternoon. And they talked to me, asking me what I knew. Okay. And I told them about, you know, somebody standing at the end of the route. So can you just tell me what happened that day? I drove by Davy's house, uh, you know, six times, six, seven times a day in my school bus. Mm -hmm. And I just looked over there and uh, someone was standing out by the edge of the road next to a white uh, work van. I really didn't even see the fire at all till later on. You know, when I went by the next time, because I turned around in, in his driveway every day, I talked to the state police and they went through my video camera and we got a picture of the guy standing at the end of the road. And it was I believe he's the one that called it in. But it's just strange that he was there before anybody else and he stayed there all day till the very end. And was he by himself, do you know? Yep, he was by himself. Did they pick up any other video footage that you know of? No, only, only of him standing at the side of the room. Now, yeah. something else I've been told is that they were looking for a black truck. Um, do you have any knowledge about what that's about? Uh, I have no idea. Were you questioned by the police or did they just come and take the video? <laughs> No, I went to, I had to go to the uh, state police office and, you know, the interrogation room and got questioned. So you didn't hear anything and you didn't see anything out of the ordinary, correct? Other than, you know, when you drove yeah, by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that phone call now opens a whole nother door that I wasn't aware of. Who was that person invested in that scene all day? Do they have anything to do with it? Why would they be the first one on scene to call it in, though, if they had something to do with it? Wouldn't they want the trailer to burn? Just more questions. So, guys, I think you're getting the picture that this is very in-depth, very detailed. I'm trying my best to keep everything rolling smoothly. I know there are some loose ends in here, but I promise we're going to tie them up by the time we are done with these videos. So in the next video, we're going to discuss even more people. We're going to discuss possible motives. We're going to go into all those threats that David was receiving from both Rusa and Chapter 8, the nephew. And we're going to actually get into more threats that happened. There are two other people that started to dig into this case. And after they started to dig into this case, they themselves started to get threats. Threats to stop and leave it alone. Some of David's property was sold to a business that is now making $2.5 million, according to BuzzFeed. So we're going to talk about how that might play a part in all of this. Thank you guys for sticking with me this entire time. You know the drill. Please share this. The more we share, the more chances are that we get someone out there that can help us or compel people to talk and speak out. 
telling you guys, there's so much involved with this. So hang tight with me. Join me on the next episode. Enjoy your day. Get out there and raise some hell. I'll see you later.